Good evening, parents, and welcome to the Parkland High School Orientation Program. My name is Jim Onis, and I'm the principal of the high school. Parkland is extremely proud of the academic excellence that it has achieved over the years, and we're very lucky to have the support of a terrific administration and school board and community who truly values an education that takes students from Parkland and allows them to excel in all of their post-secondary experiences. We are Parkland proud, and, and we're certainly proud of the different recognition that we've uh, achieved through local organizations. But what we really value most is the fact that we have the value of a well-rounded education. We believe in an education that celebrates and is rooted in excellence in arts, athletics, and academics. And you can see here through the recognition that we've received through the NAME Foundation for being recognized for one of the best communities for music education, our World Language Department and their Golden Globe Awards, the winner of Arts Education School Awards, and the annual excellence of our athletes is something that we're extremely proud of and we celebrate and we know that our students are also very proud of as well. High school team here is a terrific group of people. Uh, we work together very well in terms of our students and how we work with them. We pretty much have students assigned through the basis of your last name. So if your last name is A through FE, and that's what it begins with, you'll be working with Mrs. George. If your last name begins with FF through KR, you work with Dr. Terry Meehan. Uh, Dr. Jude Sant, who was on our staff, worked with students KS through ROM. He's now uh, working down at Springhouse at the middle school. And Mr. Craig Waters works with students last name beginning RON through Z. Instructionally, our two assistant principals who help spearhead our instructional practices, uh, Mrs. Tammy Benick and also Mr. John Monahan. Uh, they both have specific roles and you've probably seen uh, Mrs. Benick, if you've been involved with any of the program that we do in the summertime, uh, she has extensive work through summer courses, summer work, summer PE, and uh, things of that nature. Our school resource officer here, we have a great relationship with South Whitehall Township. They do a tremendous job of supporting us, and uh, we have a valued relationship with them. This is Mr. Tom Bammer. He does an excellent job, and for those of you that are wondering his role in the building, uh, He's a great resource for us. Uh, he provides us with guidance. Uh, he has great relationships with the students. He speaks to them about various issues and, and really is uh, someone that some students really come to lean on throughout the course of their school year in the high school. So uh, we're really proud of the relationship we have uh, with South Whitehall Township and Officer Bammer. Our special education coordinator for high school is Mrs. Valerie Coolidge. Uh, she doesn't have an office at the high school, but uh, we know that she spends probably 80% of her time here working with our students and supporting them. If there's any concerns that you have, uh, she's a great point person for you to contact. We're also lucky to have the Director of District and Safe of uh, District Safety and Security, Dr. Anthony Naradko, working up here at the high school, part of the high school staff. He was a longtime assistant principal here uh, prior to spearheading the transportation department, and now he is a permanent member of our staff here, and he helps prepare us for all the unforeseen circumstances which schools need to really be wary of and prepare for, because you uh, you always want to be prepared. So he does a great job with that. Our athletic director, Mr. Bill Dreisbach, uh, does a wonderful job um, being at our events, supporting our athletes and our coaches, and putting our students in position uh, to excel. Um, I know that he's worked uh, tirelessly over the summer during the, the COVID summer, if you will, and preparation for and trying to get our students on the field in the best possible situation. And uh, we're going to continue to do so as we monitor that and we hope that our student athletes have the opportunity to compete. Our Director of Visual Performing Arts, Mr. Mark Stutz, uh, does a wonderful job and you've probably seen him over the years if you have a child involved in the music program. Most of the programming concerts happen at the high school. So um, along the way, he's, he's always available to our students. He does a wonderful job creating the environment for our visual and performing arts students to excel. And we're really proud of the work that they've been able to accomplish throughout the years. 
our guidance counselors play a critical role in really building those relationships uh, between the students, especially, you know, grades nine through 12. It's, it's a process. And the student that walks in the door in ninth grade is, is not the student that walks out the door in 12th. So they play a valuable role in working with students, help creating their uh, career path in the different uh, programs and courses that they're going to be interested in. And really, they're a terrific resource for you as a parent, you know, to help process, especially if you're a first time parent of a high school student and, and they've seen students come through the system in the years. And yes, I mean, every child is different and, you know, my child are different and we all have our personal perspectives. But the reality is the guidance counselor is going to see your child in a, in a different light a little bit. And some of the things that are talked about with the guidance counselor, you know, maybe parent, maybe as a parent, uh, that child doesn't want to necessarily communicate to you right away. But your guidance counselors play a valuable role. They help prepare the student's schedule and they are a tremendous resource. So uh, I think communication with the guidance counselor is something that I would value highly as a parent. And, um, you know, here are this is our team right here, starting with Mrs. Paramba. Again, all based off of students' last names, A through BRN. Mr. Roberts, the department head, BRO through DES. Mr. Humes, Mr. Gordon, and, and as you go on down through the list here, there's 10 of them. And we also are very lucky to have Mrs. Allison McPeak, who serves as our college and career education counselor. Uh, she does a wonderful job in, in spearheading this task of really trying to explore the career options for your son or daughter and, and opening up some doors to them so they can get a better idea of what their career path may be. Now that usually comes in the form of bringing in different visitors and, and having presentations made here at the high school. This will obviously be a, a little bit different this year because uh, we're not necessarily having visitors in, but that doesn't mean that we can't connect virtually. So there's some different um, challenges that we're faced with this year but this is part of our, our counseling component. Again, I'd, if you have any questions or concerns, I, I would reach out to them and um, you know enlist their support. New to our staff this year, I almost forgot there, Mr. Lee Rosado. So he is a little bit farther down the alphabet there. Uh, parents, last name begins with SCJ through THE. Mr. Rosado was a, a longtime teacher here at the high school, a special education teacher. Um, he's uh, looking forward to joining the staff. He's done a lot of work in preparation to joining the staff. So we're really excited to have him. And we know he's going to bring an excellent perspective, um, not only to the team of counselors, but also for our parents. Student support. In addition to 11 guidance counselors that we have, we have Mr. Steve Meadowlevicious. He's a school psychologist. He works with students whose last names begin with A through LAK. Mrs. Valerie McCall student's last name LAL through Z. They play a tremendous role as well in you know helping our students who are going through different difficulties in life especially the adolescent years you know there's different challenges that students are going to be faced with some of it's social some of it's academic some of it's emotional so these are the different aspects to uh, what their job is really going to be heavily invested in we know that uh, they are terrific uh, supports for our students and you know, if you get a call from one of them, you know that typically means that someone on the staff has has uh, basically you know, shared a concern, and uh, they're reaching out to you to see if there's any support that is needed. And again, uh, a critical role. So if you do get a call from one of them, I think it's uh, something that you'd want to just take a couple steps back and and really put on the listening ears and um, see what they have to say or see what's being shared with them. The student assistance program also is another way in which we support our students. Um, it's not quite, you know, working through the psychologist perspective or lens, but we know that our students do endure different difficulties throughout the course of their high school years. And Mrs. Fitch and Mrs. Greth uh, do a terrific job of building relationships with students, building trust with students, and then furthering and developing those relationships so that uh, we know that our students can be confident in making good solid decisions and understanding the reasons why they're making the decisions that they are. They are, uh, they are critical players as well. And if you would get a phone call from one of them, that is typically also coming off of a referral 
that one of our staff members has shared. So again, you know, that we just want you to have a open mind when, uh, when you get a call from some of these people so that we can best support your child so that they can have the greatest amount of success possible here at Parkland High School. Now in years past, we typically also have assembly programs that we would bring in different speakers based on different topics or, or needs that we're seeing that need to be addressed throughout the, the student body. Now we probably, you know, we're not gonna be doing that this year unless we would have some type of breakthrough uh, with a vaccine with COVID, um, but that is part of our typical program. So um, we wanna bring in outside speakers and have them address the kids especially when you're talking about, you know, critical issues affecting teenagers, be it um, harassment, uh, be it um, some kind of uh, abuse, you know, verbal abuse, um, if it's a uh, drug abuse, you know, those topics come up quite a bit. Um, we've had some great speakers over the course of time that have really gotten some of our kids to open up. And that's our goal because if they're, you know, if they're weighing too much, on their shoulders and they have too much going on in their head and they're not able to be successful you know we have to try to um, crack into that and help uh help them get to the point where they're able to be as successful as they can be so that's just part of our program in there in terms of student support our school in general you're looking at a school of uh 3200 students grades 9 through 12. You know, right now it's it's quite a bit different through the COVID experience our hybrid schedule, we, we have over 900 students that are online. So when we do have our in-person sessions, you're probably talking about 950 students in the building at one time. Uh, that's like us having one grade in the school at a time, spread out across this big, huge facility. So it is very light. It's really easy to move around for kids. They are not crowded at all. And there's some freedom in that because now, if you want to talk to a, a faculty member or a staff member in a hallway, they're right there and you don't have to worry about traffic. You don't have to worry about cutting through kids to have a conversation. It's super easy. Now we do have 200 faculty members here on staff. Um, you have staff members that are here, are all here to support your children. Uh, they do a terrific job of building those relationships and becoming those mentors for the students. And, and uh, you know, along the way, while your child may be a ninth grader this year or a 10th grader this year, you know, over the course of time, if they're planning on going to college or if they're looking for a recommendation letter to help them in the in the workforce, you know, our teachers are, are there to write those letters. And it's the relationships that are built with your child's teachers, which go a long way and, and you know, creating some really unique recommendation letters that, are, that our teachers I know are, are very proud to write. Technology wise and facility wise, we have just about everything that a school is gonna have anywhere in America, and then some. And the fact is, we have kids that leave Parkland High School and they go to college and they find that the facilities there are less than what you have at Parkland High School. So we have the smart boards in every classroom. We have a greenhouse here if, if you're into uh, studying science and, and you wanna plant and see how things uh, develop and grow. We have the theaters, the visual arts studios, electronic music lab, Dr. Watson is in here teaching that. Um, the TV studio, which is outstanding. It's really an incredible uh, facility, which we always update. So there's uh, plenty of uh, broadcasting opportunities. In the phys ed environment or the athletic environment, we have the regulation basketball courts inside the, the gymnasium, the main gym and the auxiliary gym. We have the eight tennis courts the eight lane swimming pool with the diving well, and really excited about the turf field with all that that's been able to give us. You know, we have an opportunity to, to field hockey, lacrosse, soccer, without worrying about tearing up all the grass or, you know, um, creating an environment where we can actually play in poor weather, you know, if we had to. And of course, being the one-to-one -one environment that we are, you know, we have Wi-Fi connection all throughout the campus. Uh, kids aren't getting disconnected here in fact, I would argue that they're getting really connected here. So uh, we're really excited about where we are with all of the investments that have been made in the high school and uh, we're really proud of the work that's coming out of it with the students. So what does freshman year look like? Well, I guess the easiest thing to do is, you know, if many of you thought about what your freshman year like was in high school, 
depending on where you went to school and what your experience was, you might have thought, I got to go all the way from here, I got to go away from there, or you're looking at the school and you're thinking, that's a, that's like a college up there. You know, that's a, that's Rome, that's a city on a hill, if you will. And uh, the freshman classes, for the most part, we have them focus in the D-wing. So they're probably going to see their social studies, their English teachers, their math teachers, all in one part of the building. And the other beauty of that is that when they go to leave the D-wing to go to their science class, they're only going to the C-wing. So that's only one wing over. If they're going from the D-wing and then they're going to the cafeteria or they're going to the gymnasium for phys ed, they're only going from the D-wing, one wing over to the E-wing. Now, some students actually do have to travel from the D-wing and maybe they're involved in band, chorus or orchestra, or even the arts classes. You know, they then have to head from the D-wing over to the A-wing. Uh, we have six minutes to get the class, so we've allowed for that this year, especially. And uh, they find their way. They find the tricks of the trade and our staff is there to help them and uh, help them find the best way to get the class. We're really excited about where we are. I mean, from the middle school, you know, coming up here about the one-to-one -one laptop initiative. So we have that and we are really developing that. And over the past two years, our staff has done a tremendous job incorporating new instructional strategies into their practices. Uh, we know that all of our students are ready to excel and they have their own personal learning device. And I think our biggest challenge there is making sure that when students do come to school today or when they come to school for their experience, that their laptop is fully charged and ready to go. Now, a couple key dates in case parents are wondering this. Uh, so we're throwing in our, our picture day, which, you know, is very different this year since we're doing two days for uh, students M to Z the 17th and the 18th, and we're also doing two days for students A through L, the 21st and the 22nd. Now, a chance for you to get to meet your child's classroom teachers will be our virtual open house. And typically, this is a really wonderful evening up here at the high school in the building. Um, but like any facility, we're trying to limit traffic as best we can. So we're going to have a virtual open house. That'll be the same date as it would have been in person, but we're going to do it on 9-8 at 7 p.m. We'll release um, a link to all parents so they can access the virtual open house. And then they get to meet and hear from their, their child's teachers. So you'll be able to go through your child's classes one at a time and, and follow their schedule and hear from their teachers, listen to the course uh, expectations, the classroom environment, what it's going to look like in terms of instructional use this year, and just to prepare yourself as to, you know, the demands uh, of the coursework for your child. We also have a virtual student involvement fair. We know that we want to have students be engaged in their school. We want them to have the camaraderie of, of being in a club or an activity, the opportunity for leadership that is also involved in that growth as a student. And um, it's just a wonderful experience. And we know that many students take with them those clubs and activities and the relationships that are built there. And they take with them those relationships well past high school. And in some, in some ways that, you know, different students coming together and getting to meet each other and forming a bond through a different club or activity has changed many students' lives. So uh, we're really excited about that. This is gonna be a virtual involvement fair and we're looking at September 11th here at the high school. There'll be more to come to the students on that one. Our bell schedule, uh, we operate, the student day starts at 7.40. The students are allowed to start coming into the high school at 7.15. So at 15, 7.15, the doors open, students start to come in, and by 7.30, there's a warning bell. And by 7.40, they need to be in their first period class. We have an A schedule, which is what we're operating on pretty much most of this year. We would typically in the past have a B schedule with a homeroom, but we've decided to change things up a little bit and we're moving some of our programming uh, through Schoology and we're setting up video links so that, for example, if you saw the ninth grade or the orientation video, 
or if you saw the administrative uh, video as well, administrative welcome. So we, we're trying to push some things out that we can maybe capture through video that maybe allows us to spend more time with instruction here in the classrooms that we have since instruction in the classrooms is a lot less than it would be in a normal year. Now we do have a C schedule that we run on an early dismissal. So if we're looking at a, a one o'clock dismissal, that's typically our early dismissal day. And also the D schedule, which we would have in inclement weather. So, um, you know, if we're looking at a 940 start, our day starts at 940, and then it would still end at 230. So that would be our two hour delay schedule. In case you're wondering, the high school has four lunch periods. They're each, I think, 39 minutes long this year. Um, that, that again is modified. So those four lunch periods we have spread out pretty well. The cafeteria on the, on the inside of it, which is normally about 700 students, uh, because of six foot social distancing when we eat, is really down to 200 students. And then we have an, an additional area that is around the cafeteria and then also into the upper gym balconies where we're able to seat another 100 students. So we're able to fit capacity wise all of our students in um, the upper gym and then also in the cafeteria during this uh, our, our COVID lunch, if you will. So each of the lunch periods are a little bit different. Fourth is our smallest. Um, fifth and sixth are typically our largest, sixth being the largest. Seventh is a little bit smaller again. So when they're sitting in lunch, they're typically right now, they're always six feet apart from one another. And uh, I must say, I thought the kids were excellent today and, and how they handled themselves during the cafeteria, all four lunches. The kids were fantastic. Uh, you probably couldn't ask for more, really. They did a tremendous job. Now, our AMLCTI students, our AMLCTI students, they actually go up to uh, LCTI after they have a homeroom, at, which is in the auditorium at 7.40. It lasts for about five minutes. Then they go up to LCTI. They take their classes up there. They eat lunch up there. And then they return to the high school for their sixth period class. So they actually come back to the high school and they're going to come right in and pretty much go right to class. Then they have classes here at the high school, period six, seven, eight, nine. Educating the whole child. The value of this is, is really our philosophy that we've uh, been focused on heavily for the past five years, I would say. Our students have to earn 24.25 credits over four years to graduate. We require that all students be enrolled in 6.25 credits per year. Uh, so we know that we have many students that actually are enrolled in 6.5, 6.75, or seven credits each year. And they may walk out of here with anywhere between 26 and 28 credits over their four years. But 24.25 is the credit minimum. There is a demanding college prep program, and it's a, it's a terrific program in the sense that, that my barometer is this. When students who are in college come back after their first month and we hit homecoming, or they come back at the end of their first semester, they come back and they tell us one thing, and it's loud and clear. Wow, Parkland prepared me so much better than the rest of my college classmates. So I think that speaks a lot to the level of rigor, but also support in our college prep and our honors and our GHP classes. So that kind of sets the tone. That's a powerful message for me. So I'm really glad to support that in the work that's being done there. We have over 162 different program electives available for students, whether or not you're in the fine arts, you're in the field of technology, business departments, I mean, you name it. We have a lot of opportunity for kids to really excel and, uh, and do great things and explore their passions. And, and I think that's really critical. When we talk about educating the whole child, it's not about a, a child's GPA. It's, it's not about, you know, trying to, you know, get a higher class rank. I mean, we, don't, we don't rank students. So really we're talking about broadening the horizon of students. And those 162 credits or 162 electives allow our students to really broaden their horizons as a student. And that's really what we'd like to get the feel for. So when they leave Parkland High School, they have a plan, 
And maybe that plan changes. We know how life is. But at least we know that we've uh, allowed them to explore many different departments and uh, fields of study. We know that we allow students to customize the program uh, of the program of studies to meet their individual needs and interests. We firmly support that and we believe in that. Project Lead the Way, which is uh, one incredible program that is being offered here at the high school and it has been for quite a few years. In fact, our teachers are, are the teachers of the Project, Lay, Project Lead the Way teachers. So in the summer, when they're not here, they're actually off teaching other teachers how to teach Project Lead the Way. So they do a tremendous job. That department is led by Mr. Kester. Whether or not it's engineering, or it's biomed, or it's comp sci, uh, they do a tremendous job. And that program is a terrific hands-on experience for students, which is, uh, it's really a rigorous program, but it's also a, a very supportive program and hands-on and kids love it. Now, what else do we have in mind here? Well, we know that we offer a variety of different levels of programming, even if it's, if it's AP, honors, gifted high potential, CP. We also offer a career education and work readiness class, which is really based on developing the skills that what we call the CEW students, career education and work, the CEW courses, you know, how can we best prepare them for the job and the skills that they're going to need in their field of study post high school. So we're really proud of the work that's being done at these levels. I am not a believer in if you have advanced placement, you have to be advanced placement in every single course you take. I'm not a believer in honors. If you're in honors courses, you can only take honors and you can't take a GHP or a CP class. Uh, I don't think we're all built that way. I don't think we're robots. I think there are certain subjects where you might not have the same tenacity for or the same passion for. And um, sometimes just taking a GHP course actually just allows your schedule to just work. They allow you to get everything, every single course you want. So, you know, in terms of the work, I don't, I don't think you want to pigeonhole your students into one category or one level. I wouldn't care what other people sit around and say on the athletic fields when you're talking as parents. I think you got to do what's best for your child. And, um, you know, sometimes that's just focusing in on what they're capable of and what their strengths are. And I don't think you want to put your child in a position to be in over their head just for the sake of being in a certain level course. So that's a little personal philosophy I'll share on that. And I know our counselors in a lot of ways would, would say the exact same thing. We have 27 different dual enrollment courses that we actually offer. So we partner with L3C and Seton Hall University where our students can be enrolled here working with our teachers, but yet they're getting um, college credit through L3C and they're getting college credit through Seton Hall University. Now Seton Hall is primarily based with the world languages. Our L3C program also has world languages, also the arts and some math as well. So. Uh, we're really excited. There's a lot of situations where we see students coming out of Parkland High School with six to 12 credits that they've earned. They've either earned them through a dual enrollment courses that they've taken, or they've earned them through a score that they achieved on an advanced placement test. So um, that's a tremendous thing because it's a, it's a great college savings to you as parents. And you also know that your child is ready for the college workload. And uh, that answers a question or two in terms of how ready are they and where are they at. Now, just to give you an idea, 86% of our class of 2018 went on a two and four year colleges and another 13% or so there joined the workforce directly. So, you know, 86 out of 100 of our students, they're, they're heading to two year, four year colleges. And that's one of the great things about our student body. They're focused, they're driven, they're motivated. And I think a lot of the distractions that affect a lot of students don't affect them because of that focus that they have and the commitment to uh, being the best possible student they can be. And it's really a credit to you as parents that that's the community that you are creating within not just the family unit, but also throughout Parkland. Now, also, educating the whole child, how it relates to the arts. 
band, orchestra, chorus, you're talking about periods three through five. Well, typically, we changed that this year a little bit. So we created a, a ninth grade band, a ninth grade chorus, a ninth grade orchestra, all the way up through. So ninth, 10th, 11th, and 12th. So it's a little bit different this year. Uh, there's also some things that we, we can't quite do that we would normally do. Singing, for example, is uh, really difficult right now. And I don't know that we're gonna be able to have an opportunity to do that much. But at the same time, you know, what can we capture and what can we do online? What can we do outside? You know, what can we do? It's pretty much been the mantra of, uh, I know Mr. Stutz and all of the people in the arts trying to find a way for us to accomplish what we typically have done in the past. But that's a work in progress and there are some limitations that we have to live with right now. But I know that won't stop Mr. Anonia or Mr. Mishler or Mr. LaRue from finding ways to work with our students. I know, I know they're gonna continue to grow. Theater-wise, the same way. Ms. Ropash and Mrs. Smith doing a terrific job and you know having a great theater experiences, whether or not you're in theater one, two, three, or four, or if you're participating in our fall play or the children's show or, or the spring musical, Mr. Anonia has the musical. Uh, they do a terrific job with uh, really developing the talent of our students. Uh, again, terrific bonds and relationships with those students. And sometimes, you know, it, it's hard in those environments because it's really hard when you have so much talent and the district is filled with talent and it's hard to pick different, you know, roles for different students and to develop, you know, a program or a play and, and not really crush the spirits of, a, of another person who loves music and theater as much as our students do. But uh, they do a terrific job and I think we're gonna talk about that a little bit more here in a second. Oh, backtrack. Here's Mr. Anonia with the chorale. This would have been a performance from Neff's Church. Uh, that's usually, I think it's the second Sunday that they would have a show up at Neff's Church and uh, the crowd would do it. It's a great performance. It's a lot of fun. It's some off the cuff stuff that they surprise people with. And uh, it's usually a great, a great experience for the kids and the families that are there. And it's usually packed too. So you might want to get there early. So Parkland Theater pretty much is a, it's a really year long event. It's a year long program. So uh, starting, you know, you'd have the play, uh, which I think Mr. Stutz is already, uh, you know, looking at auditions for the children's show, which typically follows up after the play and is done before we would hit uh, Christmas, the spring musical, which you're talking about in April. And we also have different activities like Books Alive, they have one act competitions and technical crew club. So there's so many different ways you could be involved in the performing arts club and Parkland theater. Really, it's a, it's a great opportunity to, uh, for kids to have some responsibility. It's challenging work, it's demanding work, but what I love is so much of it is student driven and student focused. So um, it's a credit to them and their leadership ability that they're able to do all that they can with our productions. So our production this year, all I need to know I learned in kindergarten. This will be our fall play, which will be presented virtually October 8th through the 10th. So once again, I think Mr. Stutz was just finalizing, um, it might not be finalized, but I know he's doing auditions for this play. We're, uh, we're still in a little bit of a holding pattern with uh, the release of our children's show. Mrs. Smith is our guru here. She does a fantastic job helping to develop the talents of our thespians. So um, once we hear more from that, I'm sure that'll be broadcast for everyone to see and know in case your child's interested in uh, performing the children's show. And the children's show is a great way for our ninth and 10th grade students to get engaged in a theater program um, as they pretty much hone and develop their skills while they're younger. Uh, this is a, a great spot for them to start. Athletically, Parkland really does believe in the fact that co-curricular athletic activities are an integral part of our culture. It, it does in some ways, you know, define what people think of or when they hear about Parkland, they think about our athletic teams. It's just one component of, I think, what we do really well. Uh, but there's definitely a lot of pride in it. And because we have so many co-curricular activities, 
and so much competition within our athletic programs, the teams typically excel. After school, we run a bus, you know, it's important. We want kids to be here. We want them involved in athletics. We know that there's so many leadership and teamwork skills that they're going to learn. So we run an activity bus. It's available to uh, have students leave here after school. So they're able to get on that bus and head home after their athletic or extracurricular activity. We do offer 23 sports for students to participate in. And of those students, you know, last year, we had 75 students that moved on to play collegiate sports. You know, divisions one, two, and three, 75 different kids are gonna continue their playing experience at the next level. And, and we're very proud of that. And I can tell you that, you know, if you don't know a Parkland athlete, many people outside the community have a different, I would say, perspective of a Parkland athlete. Um, but being the principal here and not living in the community and learning the community over the past nine years or so, what I will tell you is this, the, the Parkland athlete is focused, competitive, hardworking, tough. I mean, just, I mean, really tough in my, in my opinion, what I've seen. And they're committed, uh, they're committed and, and they, don't, um, they don't expect anything in life. You know, they, they have to work for everything. And I, I think that's what people don't understand about um, the mentality of not only then like the, the athlete, but also the student athlete. They carry the same skills into the student learning environment. And I know that other kids see it. Just like the kids in a the theater program or in the art program, you have to work, you have to work. And everybody sees that. And, they, and I think it drives everyone to another level of excellence. And I, I, it's credit to, the, to our students and the work ethic, um, you know, I will, uh, you know, you joke, but I'll come in here on a Friday night to watch, um, to watch basketball game. Okay. And there's the baseball team and they're in the gym and they're working out while their friends are up, you know, up above cheering on the basketball players and the basketball players are playing and the baseball players are in there working out. And I think there's something to be said for that. Or when you show up at seven and you see a, a girl coming out of the pool and, um, you know, she's walking up through the hallway and her hair's soaking wet or the guys are, you know, they've got their blonde hair going once we hit the playoff season and such and the swimmers, you know, you know, that these kids are in here and they're putting a lot of effort into what they do. And, you know, they always have a smile on their face. They always treat everybody with respect. And I think that's uh, just a really something that I think the culture of the athletic program here has um, really creating some excellent individuals that I'm very, very proud of. And yes, annually, we're going to compete for District 11 and league championships. And we're going to compete for state championships, you know, when they, when they arise and when our, when our kids are able to uh, get to that point. And we're really proud of uh, all the work that they've done. Here you see some of our kids in, in competition. Now, what can we do if you're not an athlete or maybe you don't love you don't love the arts or maybe you know you're not as engaged in these things parkland high school has a club for everybody we have something that has to interest you and it's a great way to get involved and make this school a whole lot smaller we have over 75 clubs we actually take new clubs every year and all we're looking for is something that's going to engage kids have them participate have them do something or create something positive and have the ability to uh, really contribute to our school environment. And they do an outstanding job. So this is something that we celebrate. We're gonna talk about it at the involvement fair on um, September 11th, you know, this for a student perspective, many of these events may be virtual this year, but if they watch the TV announcements, if you check on Schoology and a Parkland High School website, you'll see different uh, announcements for these different clubs as they meet throughout the course of, of the school year. Be it virtually, that's primarily going to be the way they're meeting this year, but um, but there may be times when they meet in person, but that's going to be on a more selective note. You can also, as a parent, go on the Parkland High School website where you can check under clubs and activities and you can see the student activities guide and go through all the different clubs that we have to offer up at the high school.
Here's some of our students. This is our pep band playing on the left from a basketball game. You see, um, this is actually from Steel Stacks. This is the prom court from, um, I'm trying to think here, it was two years ago. That's our prom court. And uh, they were all jazzed up and excited. And then down below on the right, we have uh, what is really kind of a wild and crazy event, Mr. Parkland. So Mr. Parkland is a tremendous fundraiser for the seniors, the senior class. And each year, students compete and put together a um, personal performance. And um, let, let's just say it's a, it's a sight to be seen. It really is. So they do a great job and it's always has a great turnout from the student body. So class dues wise, uh, it's a little thing, but every school has class dues. You know, that's gonna help fund some of activities that we do throughout the course of the year, whether or not we're bringing in someone to speak to our student body, uh, whether or not we're donating to uh, a different organization or preparing for the prom and also the post-prom party. We collect this money usually during open house. So we'll have to set up a system for, um, for collection this year as we're not gonna be collecting live here at the high school, but we'll have something in place. And, you know, afterwards uh, we're looking, um, you know, if you get it paid before the second semester of your senior year, it's still $20. Now, the big issue obviously in public schools is safety and security. And I can tell you that the school district is, I mean, outstanding in how we prepare. And I know Dr. Naradko typically is addressing this slide with, uh, with you as parents, and, and he does an amazing job preparing our school district to, uh, you know, be, to basically be prepared. Uh, we have a couple different things that we utilize. You know, Bark and Securely is basically, it's an online screening program, which is gonna pick up uh, different emails and, and keywords and emails and alert our school district staff to uh, different concerns that we have or that we might have. I should say that sometimes, because that's the way it is as well. Safe to Say Something is a program that the state initiated uh, last year, and it's a, it's a tremendous boost to us because it really gives kids an anonymous voice. Heck, it could give a parent an anonymous voice and share with us uh, critical information that could be impacting our students negatively. We have a reunification plan that we utilize. Um, you know, if we were to, to be in a situation where we had to evacuate and uh, have our students, you know, on different parts of our campus. Uh, we have a, a reunification plan that we follow, that we practice, that we're ready for, uh, so that, you know, if we would have to have parents come up here to the high school in some kind of emergency fashion, we would have a way in which we would be able to have you reunified with your child. All of our work and our focus, you know, is reviewed through Department of Homeland Security in terms of the standards that they set you know, we work in alignment with those practices. Uh, we have connections and contacts within that organization that we can refer to. And, you know, that really plays a, a valuable role. And, you know, is, there's so much planning involved. And in, for example, we use Navigate Prepared as a way in which we're able to keep all of our school district documents and our school district plans and the communication plans that we need to have there. That's kind of like our home base, if you will as to how we would you know, orchestrate and organize, especially in terms of emergency. And there's so much data and documentation and paperwork in, involved in this. And there's something that, you know, safety wise, we can never be wrong. So um, we don't plan to be, we're never gonna accept that as a you know, possibility. So there's a lot of work that goes into that. And we really preach to the students and our, and our students do a good job. If they see something, they say something. And that's our approach. They've been able to uh, do that for the past several years. And it's really helped us um, prevent some ugly situations from occurring. And when I say that, I, I, know, I mean minor ugly situations, like altercations between kids, or if you know there's extended harassment going on. You know, they, our kids communicate when they see someone that is being either picked on, or if they see someone being harassed, our kids will tell us. And I think that's a credit to who they are. And of course, we do lots of training throughout the course of the year, uh, be it Stop the Bleed. Um, we have a lot of you know, CPR training here at the high school as well. There's a lot that goes into making sure our staff is prepared. Now, one thing, oops, 
one thing that I will share with you, and if you've seen this, you you know what I'm talking about now. Jules last year and the year before, more so I would say even the year before, um, were more of an issue. And uh, they were an issue in the high school because they're so easy to hide. And if you see this, it looks like it's just a jump drive, if you will, that you'd plug into your laptop on the side of it there. Now these items I'm sharing with you because as a parent, you have to know what this is. You just do, okay? If that means that you're in your child's book bag every now and then, just going through it here or there, or if you see something like this, especially if it looks, and if it says jewel on it, or if it looks like it's a cylinder in here, or you're seeing these cartridges or these plastic cartridges that you can pull off, you know, there's something to talk about with your child. They're very sleek, they're very teenage focused, if you will, and they're typically filled with nicotine. Um, that's the problem. You know, and if they're not filled with nicotine, if people are filling them with, you know, um, anything that would have THC in it, well, that's a larger problem. So, you know, this is just a small sample of what this is here. If you have any questions or concerns about this, if you see these things in your child's room and you're not sure what to do, how to handle it, or you just want to talk about it, my advice is you talk to Mrs. Fitch or Mrs. Greth from our student assistance program and they can help at least, they can give you some information and you can listen to what they have to say and figure out what's the best course of action. Uh, the problem is the addictive nature of these pods. Because they're filled with nicotine, kids are using it, they're using it quickly and they're developing a problem. They're, they're developing an addiction to nicotine and the addiction to nicotine is, is worse than some of the addiction that is some of the other things that we're seeing kids get involved with so it's something that we want you to have your eyes on and be aware of and maybe this is old news but when you have teenagers you know you always got to be on alert you just do so uh, we just wanted to share that with you in case you didn't know what this was again talk contact mrs fitch or mrs greth we do have a progressive discipline policy here at the high school if we have to uh, talk to your child about anything you know, we'll give the verbal or the written warnings because that's a, that's appropriate. You know, you want to have a warning if something's going on in the class. You want your child to be warned if it, um, you know, it falls on a smaller scale of, of issues or concerns. You know, if we have to have you in for a meeting as a parent, we'll bring you in. We'll talk about it. We'd rather start talking about things early and address them early than when it's too late. Because, you know, we do have to issue some types of consequences for certain things that, as they occur. So we issue lunch attentions, which kids absolutely hate, by the way. Um, it's been a, a terrific um, tool for us. Rather than even sending a kid in a Saturday detention, we, we set up lunch attentions and then they can't be with their friends. Now this year, that's really different with lunch being the way it is, but um, kids love being with the friends in lunch. So that's worked. We have after school attention which is long and extended. It's gonna go from 2.30 to, to your 4.20, so that's that's a long time. We in school suspend students on occasion for certain violations of the code of conduct. Obviously, that's more of a step because you're removing a student from class, but it, it is an alternative and we've used it and it, and it works well. And if you have an in-school or, or an out-of-school suspension, you're gonna, you're gonna be contacted by a school administrator. You're gonna hear from them personally. You're gonna find out what happened it was probably going to have an in-depth conversation as to what occurred. Um, and uh, you know, that's just part of the process. There is a code of conduct that we follow. And uh, when we adhere to it and uh, follow it, everything works great up here. And if you have an extreme case of disciplinary situation, you know, you might have a possession of a knife if someone is doing something like that. And unfortunately, sometimes, sometimes students are just a little bit sloppy, like they've been out fishing or they've been out hunting and they don't put something away you know unfortunately we deal with those and we try to be smart about it but it's you know it's that would be classified as a weapon and, and that would be a problem so you know in most extreme cases it's a referral to the superintendent so again you'll be contacted by mail for any offense resulting in detention and you'll be contacted by phone for any suspension 
a big a big topic right now obviously for teenagers is social media whether or not it's TikTok, instagram twitter you know you, you name it and i think you're you know every now and then i don't know if it hurts you as a parent to just sit down with your child and ask them to show you their instagram sit down with them say show me your twitter page sit down with them show me what you're viewing on TikTok, because that is going to help give you an idea of maybe what's going on in their head a little bit and that's something that you know as a parent you know you always want to know some things you know some things are harder to know <laughs> some things are harder to deal with but at the same time you'd rather be in the know than not know so we're always talking to kids about being smart about what they post about not harassing any peers about not promoting the harassment of any peers uh, but kids need to think about it before they post i can tell you that there are things that were posted two and three and four years ago by students that i am still getting emails about from the general public because it gets reposted and people think that it's live people think that it's real like it's happening right now and even if the school district addresses the situation it's still out there there is no delete in cyberspace it doesn't go away so i want people to know that and i think we talk about it a lot but for kids you know especially if you're waiting till boom something happens and oh no everybody knows about it well, then it's too late so as a parent if i'm if i'm a parent and i have three boys i want to get on their twitter page and i want to get on their instagram page and i want to know what they're viewing and you know i'm paying for that phone so I have every right to know what's going on on that phone. And that's pretty much the way I look at it as a parent. Um, and I hope that, you know, again, from an educational component, they have to be smart about what they're posting. There is cyberbullying that occurs. There is sexting issues that are, that are really prevalent in high school America. It's not high school Parkland. It's high school America. Um, we know that kids are bullied and they get into ugly confrontations and sometimes they don't handle that well and we want to try to support them but at the same time somebody's doing the bullying and it has to stop it has to be addressed sexting a really difficult topic but at the same time there are i mean there are boys out there and there are websites out there and there are men out there people posing as somebody else who are pressuring usually young girls into sending images of themselves it's a real concern. It's a dire concern is what I would say. No matter what level of relationship your child thinks she has with somebody else, I would never, ever, 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 ever want them to be sending an image of themselves because it, it always seems to recirculate. It always does. And they need to know that. And I would reinforce it. Um, there are, you know, some real heavy duty cases that we've dealt with in the past about this. And it's a, you know, it's a common problem amongst high school principals. I talk to others who are dealing with the same thing, you know, that we are here. But again, you can't talk to your child enough about these issues. One thing we could um, benefit from, you know, from your perspective, we know that as parents, we communicate differently with our children than our, than our parents communicate with us. But, you know, if you do text your child, try to keep it during lunch. So know when their lunch period is. And if you do text them, that's great. Try not to text them during, say, uh, Alge 1 class or, you know, if they're in biology class. Try not to text them during that. those classes. It's just a big disruption. So we're trying to cut down on that. Uh, we don't want any other texting going on during the school day. And um, that's just something that we're, we're focused on. We know that kids text during lunch. We know that they may, you know, if they do text you during the day, if you, if you could just let them know, hey, not now, even if you know it's important, not now, text me during lunch, text me after school, but not now. If you could just help drill home that message, uh, that would be that would be terrific. Now, 
for a ninth grade student coming into you know the new high school experience obviously we want everyone to be successful i think the most stress i've seen from students just in the past 24 hours is the student that walked in and didn't have their laptop charged there's a high level of stress in that environment at the same time from a home perspective making sure that your child is turning the work in on time and make sure that if there's any concern or anything that needs to be talked about with your teacher make sure that your child is communicating with the teacher now i said that in a distinct way because i think it's important at ages 14 15 16 17 especially 14 and 15 students need to learn if they don't yet know how how to communicate with their teachers they need to own that responsibility it's a process i know that i have my own children it's the same thing you um you may support them with that process but but don't be the only person that's commuting with communicating with your child's teacher make sure that communication is going through your child and the teacher try to keep it that way and i think you'll see a lot of progress and a lot of growth with your child as they establish that level of um, responsibility on their own you want to try to make sure whether or not you're online or if you're not an online student but it's when your child is at home because it's not their day in the cohort to be here make sure you have that routine at home you know if it's a routine we have at school sure but we also need to have that routine followed at home it'll probably just create the best home environment for you in my opinion the structure kids need structure i would um try to have it in place as best as possible and and the last you know two things there in terms of the transition to high school can be tough Middle school is one thing. High school is a different animal. The, the responsibility, um, the workload might be a little bit uh, tougher. They're probably going to have to study in a different way and have a more focused um, study habits, if you will, as opposed to maybe just preparing uh, the night before or being able to walk into a test and do well. Uh, I'd advise students to be studying, you know, a little bit each night. You're not talking a whole lot of time, but just make sure they're studying after they do their assignments. It doesn't hurt, and I'm sure um, it's always work. It's always good to work from high ground, so I'd want them to be overprepared as opposed to underprepared. And again, if anyone has any questions about how we can help you as a parent, and we can help your, your ninth grade student or you know a new student to the high school, just ask, and we'll be glad to help you. And you can reach out to your guidance counselors, you can reach out to um, the administrators here at the high school, or your child's teachers. Be glad to help out. We do have a dress code here. It is page 35 of the student planner, which students would have received today. Or if you're an in person student on Thursday and Friday, you'll receive that. You know, we ask for everyone's compliance with that. Our goal when we have a dress code violation is to find um, the student an alternative um, piece of clothing or so so that they can get back to class. We want to minimize the amount of time away from class. But we do have some standards that we need to live up to. So um, we expect that all of our students to do a good job with this and you know, everything will move along well. Now, from your perspective, how can you find out more information about Parkland High School? And, and what are your resources? Uh, maybe besides, you know, you could read the morning announcements. Uh, monthly, we send home a parent newsletter. Sometimes I think that parent newsletter gets overlooked a little bit. I would say stay in tune with that parent newsletter, especially this year. We're going to try to send as much information at home to home as we can. Um, that information hopefully stops changing as we prepare for the start of school. It's been a long summer, uh, but the newsletter is very valuable. We also have parent forum, which is an opportunity for us to showcase different activities at the high school or different events or concerns that the high school may have. We try to pr provide educational opportunities for parents so they can learn more about the high school experience. Be it if, um, you know, we're talking about various topics, but I can tell you one that we always do, which is preparing your child for, you know, the freshman and sophomore year, college bound, their junior and senior, college bound. What should you be doing? What should you be looking at? Um, what do you need to learn more about as a parent? We also have the post-prom committee, which is also an incredibly valuable uh, program up at the high school. And I, and I call it a program because 
they do a tremendous job of putting on a post-prom event from 11.30 to 5 a.m. The, the, the night immediately after prom. So if prom ends at, you know, 10.30 or so, by 11.30, we're all here back at the high school, and we have a tremendous turnout. Over 800 kids, and they're all going to come in here, and we have a great time with them, and most importantly, it's safe. But our parents do a ton of work for this, and they are tremendous. But they also need support, and they need people to get involved and do the work. And it's a great behind-the-scenes um, committee if you want to join that provides an invaluable resource to our students. I leave here at 5 a.m., like 5.30ish, typically that day, and um, I'm thrilled. I'm exhausted, but I'm thrilled because I know we had a great turnout. Our kids are safe, and it was great seeing all their fa smiling faces all night long while they're sitting here having a good time, doing different events, being out there in the gymnasium, eating food, getting massage on massage tables. There's so much going on here that night that our parents really help drive and create. Now their meetings are gonna be virtual as well this year. So we'll get that, you'll see that information that's posted in the newsletter. And I'm sure there'll be a link that follows up for people to uh, learn more about the post-prom committee. So just a couple other items here. We have our virtual open house, which will be Tuesday, September 8th. You'll receive a link to that so you can uh, watch it and enjoy it and hear from uh, your child's teachers. We also have a post-secondary financial aid night. There'll be more information to follow about this, uh, but we have some great uh, people that we work with that help uh, share a ton of information about the financial aid process and how to prepare for that. And uh, we know that those opportunities will be ongoing, so we'll be sharing some more information later on. And then the fall workshop, which is also uh, what I just mentioned there from a, that's a parent forum that we have Wednesday to 16th, and it'll also be virtual as well. I really wanna thank everyone for taking the time to view tonight's presentation. I can tell you that our first day at school today was an outstanding success. I couldn't be prouder of the cooperation that we received from our students. I'm not surprised, but they were all in. For the students that were here, they were masked up, they were socially distant, they were cooperative, especially within uh, the confines of a, a very different cafeteria experience, and, and they did an outstanding job. So I was very proud of our staff and our, and our students today. So just want to share that with you as a parting piece of information. But thanks again, and uh, should you have any concerns, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. We'd be glad to help you. Thank you.